from the picture? It's kind of like herding cats. Is this how your roles and groups feel for you? If so, we think you've come to the right place today. Uh, dealing with so many different types of users, perhaps multiple systems of record, uh, perhaps dealing with uh, uh, different, uh, different types of staff or faculty or multiple types of affiliates or just getting it all to work together uh, and getting folks the right access to what they need can be a tremendous job. So today we have to speak to you three champion cat herders, if you will. Uh, Brett Beaver from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln is going to speak about what he has been doing with uh, their faculty and staff and students. Uh, and Esther Cha from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign is going to talk to you about things going on in Illinois related to affiliate users. And then finally, DePriest Dawkins from the University of Michigan is going to wrap it up talking about the vended solution that they have implemented to pull all of these things together nicely. So with no further ado, I'm going to hand things over to Brett. All right, great. Thanks, Keith. Yeah, this is Brett Bieber from the University of Nebraska. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is um, some incident that we had with the Lincoln campus. And in case you, um, I'll be wearing the University of Nebraska Lincoln hat uh, today, uh, even though I work for the University of Nebraska now with our IT consolidation. So mostly I'll be talking about our campus perspective. And the main topic I want to talk about is an internal audit finding and how we work to remediate that. Um, and the three main points that I'll have today is that internal audit is your friend and can really help you implement some of these things if, they, um, if they're uh, exercised in the right place and the right time. How we can find key stakeholders that are going to support changes to roles or deploying role-based access controls and um, having some allies to prepare for battle. Because if you need to change the definition of a role, uh, that can really impact your campus, and it can be a battle. And then the, the last step, I'll go, I'll go through our remediation plan for the internal audit findings that we had. And in particular, I'm going to dig into how we unleashed some of the data that we had within our HR system to deliver uh, a lot more automation to groups and security uh, using Grouper and the tools that are available through that. So first I want to talk about the audit finding that we had. And this was about uh, two years ago. And the policy that they found uh, that we were out of compliance with is, is pretty plainly stated. When any user terminates his or her relationship with the University of Nebraska, his or her ID and password shall be denied further access to computing resources. So a very simple, uh, succinct statement there. And internal audit, this was a, a simple thing for them to find uh, that we were out of compliance with. And it was something that we were aware of. We had been aware of this issue for uh, a while, but really lacked the guidance from uh, leadership and from other parties to implement any change in our practices. So the two findings that, that came out of this was, one, former employees at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln had eight weeks of access after they were no longer employed. And this was mainly for um, allowing users to transition out of their official university email. Um, but that was, in, um, that was against the university policy. That was one of the findings. The second finding was that all of the access that was set up for many of these uh, grad assistants and um, staff members, faculty members, et cetera, it would stick around. They were all manually maintained and they were not being properly managed. When someone left the institution, that group would not be updated. And when they changed roles, that would not get updated either. So those are the two audit findings. And uh, if you've ever had this, I, I don't know, it's not, a, it's not a great feeling when an audit finding gets uh, identified and and your name is listed on the party responsible for remediating the issue. And, and you know that that's something that's going up to the chancellor or the president uh, uh, for their review. Um, it's, it's sort of a heavy responsibility. But um, I, I, 
I will say that internal audit can be a really good friend to you when you want to implement some changes that may be painful if you don't have them as an ally. So this timeline diagram kind of explains the challenge that we were facing. And across the bottom you have a number of uh, diamonds that explain the uh, individual events within the hiring life cycle. First you might have a letter of offer, someone would key it into the HR system, hopefully before the person starts their first uh, day on the job. And then the employee's job would start. You may have a move between departments during their um, association with the university. And then their job would end. And there's another diamond in here that we call separation, which is a distinct event and different than their job ending, where someone would have to perform an additional step to essentially end that person's relationship with the entire university. And that's when we would start a timer and we would give them eight weeks of additional access to their email to clean up anything. And consequently, the Active Directory was still a, uh, Active Directory account was still on, so they would still have access to departmental file shares and those sorts of things. That was the area where we were out of compliance. If you look at the arrows up above, you'll see that some services were using different timings for when they would start, when they would stop, and as you think about these roles and affiliations, it's really important for everyone to come to the same understanding of which events um, cause something to start and stop and what those dates are in our systems of record so that everyone is in agreement of when these services should be starting and stopping. Brad, if I can interrupt you for a quick second. We got a question from Mark Seibel from MCMC. Uh, about uh, how things uh, work when someone is uh, an active student but uh, leaves employment, how you're juggling those, those multiple role type things. Yeah, that's a really good point. So I'm sure you're all familiar with the Edu-Person affiliation attributes in your directory. And what we use is we would obviously have a multi-value attribute in there, people that ha can have multiple roles at once. For some services, we determine a trump order of uh, eligibility for access and we understand that people may have multiple roles at the same time uh, for those high-level affiliations. And uh, our student timing diagram, I can share a link to that later. We have a similar student timing diagram that follows what our registrar had identified for when we determine someone is an active student and other events in the student life cycle that may turn on or off uh, certain affiliations or roles for their student relationship. Today I'll be focusing mainly on the employee ones, but I will gladly share you the timing diagram for our students as well so that you can get a, uh, a better understanding of how this relates to and may be comparable to the student life cycle. And speaking of the employees, Karen Harrington from Virginia Tech asked uh, how you handle giving former employees access to W-2s. Yeah, so that's a good point. Um, right now, and, and one of our older practices was that they would still have access for 90, 91 days, but obviously people would uh, need to get their W-2s if they left very early on in the year and their account would be gone. How would they get their W-2 afterwards? Well, for those folks, we would just print it and mail it to them. That works. <laughs> <laughs> So the timing diagram here just gives you a better understanding of, of uh, also a communication tool, I think, for getting everyone on the same page of what the problem is and where we need to move to. So this was a tool that we helped develop at the beginning to understand where we were at, where we were out of compliance, and where we were going. The one area that I wanted to mention here between the job end date, which says a person is a staff member or a faculty member or uh, whatever their affiliation was, and the separation. There's a limbo state in there where their job had ended, uh, but the department hadn't separated them yet. We found 1,700 people inside that limbo state where we didn't know what their current relationship was with the institution. We recognized that as a risk, and so what we had done is we agreed that the job end date would be the date that we wanted to end services by. And so that was a, an important decision that we had to make. And part of that decision is finding the right allies and the right group of people to make a change to when services start and stop. So 
the next stage I want to I want to talk about is identifying your key stakeholders. So without support for this and making these huge changes, uh, we wouldn't have been able to uh, get very far. So I have a number of areas of the campus here that were involved in our offboarding task force in helping me remediate this challenge, this uh, audit finding. If, as you think about your affiliations, think about all of those data stewards or data owners on your campus that are responsible for those affiliations. And it's important to get their participation in this process and support so that they can talk to, their, to the faculty, they can talk to the staff side, they can talk to um, the business and finance and the risk implications of all of this. And all of these partners work together to ensure services are going to start and stop at the right time. So I just want to emphasize that having the right group of people is going to be essential in making changes to your roles or helping you define those roles. We do have a couple other questions, Brett. Uh, Tom Barton wanted to know how you uh, ensure that the uh, HR entry um, precedes the actual job start date. Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, what we do is we started a very big communication plan, and I'll talk about that in our remediation plan here. We developed a series of communication materials that explained to the campus the connection that they had between the data in the HR system and the services that we'd be delivered, and the responsibility that that gave every department for managing their employees appropriately. We held workshops across the campus. I think we had 13 workshops that we held over a series of uh, three months, I believe, trained 155 people across all of the campuses, and essentially made this required training for every HR person. The other key thing that Audit had identified, and we have identified this as well, is that IT isn't always in the loop with personnel changes. So we required not only the HR person for every department across the campus to participate in this and take this training, but also an IT representative from their department so that both sides were hearing the same message about the connection that they had and the responsibility of controlling their employee data and when services would start and stop. And we had a similar question. We had a similar yeah. question but about temporary employees. Um, I'm, I'm guessing you've had the same challenges there with a temporary employee who's not actually being paid but remains active. Uh, yeah, with trying, I'll talk. Yeah. Exactly. So, so we had to develop some new tools to help departments manage their employees. Um, one of those, we can talk about temp, or, uh, temp workers or uh, let's say a, an adjunct professor that only teaches in the spring semester, fall semester, et cetera. We developed a tool that we called Continue Services, Keep Services Active. It's a flag that is in our HR system that allows the department to positively indicate that a person should continue their existing relationship with the university until a specified date out in the future. So what that means is that if the uh, adjunct professor, their paid job ends in May, the department can enter in a future Keep Services Active date that extends their sponsorship out into the fall with the intent that they will rehire this person in the fall or in the next, um, in the following academic year so that services, we can bridge that gap between services. We also developed a report and gave this to the uh, departments of any of these employees that are going to be losing services in the next 65 days. This was essential for the departments to know who are the employees that I need to begin working on some paperwork for. I need to start submitting, uh, getting some documents ready, uh, either enter in that keep services active date or uh, extend their appointment out into the future. We also identified that temp workers and hourly workers, you know, people that just work uh, 10 hours one week and they may not work the next week, um, there were a lot of those people that were entered in as hourly workers and they may have been sitting in there associated with the department for an extended period of time and they, had never, they hadn't been paid in months. So that student, you know, he left and he got a job at Burger King. Uh, he was still on record with the university. So we developed a report for departments to run that would identify these temp workers that haven't been paid in a while. So they, would, they could um, perform some action on them, like shut down their access, end their appointment, file a separation. And do you handle things similarly with adjunct 
faculty who may not be there all the time but comes and goes as you do the temp workers? Uh, so the adjunct faculty, that would that would be the case where we would put in the Keep Services Active flag. That's mainly used for faculty that uh, uh, teach 9 over 12 or just one semester. Um, temp or hourly workers, those are uh, a, a different situation where we had to, they're typically entered in with a, a end date so far out in the future that it, we would never reach that end date for them. So we had to develop a different tool to allow departments to monitor for when those employees um, may not be active with the department. So we also developed the offboarding checklist, and this is a series of steps that the department should perform when an employee is leaving their department. And it talks about what do you do with your email, uh, how do I transfer files for Box, um, business continuity aspects like that, as well as uh, reminders to collect material, uh, issued equipment, those sorts of things. So there's a, a lot of IT-related steps on that, as well as um, HR-related steps, advice for them. You know, make sure your, your address is up to date so that we can mail you your W-2 in the future, those sorts of things. And we developed an onboarding and offboarding websites. I don't know if those links are available, but um, uh, I'd be happy to share those links with you all. The one item that I did want to dig into a little bit more is how we deployed Grouper with reference data to um, fill that gap between access and access management and improve access for um, the campus. So I'm sure you're all familiar with what we had before. What we had before was people were creating groups and maintaining them manually, manually assigning access for a, t a group of people, Mary, John, and Michael. Now, if you're part of an institution where you may be populating some of those edu-person affiliation attributes inside your directory, like employee, faculty, staff, affiliate, that's one way that you could scope um, some security, but it wasn't enough for our campus. Now, I'll call this organizational plus, where you can add into your directory a department name or something like that. So let's say this is the cat herder department. And then you might have some smart or clever IT folks throughout the campus that can write a PowerShell script that would look for that attribute value and then update a security group. But that's not exactly what we were hoping to do. We wanted to get more data into the hands of the developers and, and distributed IT staff across the campus. So what I mean by that is actually the hats that they wear. So not the people themselves, but their position or their job or their role. So working with HR, we were able to identify for every person uh, a unique attribute inside the HR system that pertains to their position or their job or their role. And that unique number will not change even if a new, a new person comes in and takes over that old person's job. That number will not change. It will stay the same. And so here on the right-hand side, we have these different jobs, cat herder, cat analyst, cat developer. Each of them have a different hat. The other piece of data that we were able to get inside Grouper was the relationships between those two. So we have groups related to the cat herder reports and the cat herder team to transition us from using people-based groups into data driven, attribute driven groups for based on their roles or based on the relationship that they had. I got a few examples here of how we name some of these and the main point I wanted to make here is that we have the IDs for the groups that are not changing but through the grouper loader jobs we're able to expose a different display name that brings more data to the end users so that it's in your face. So each of these groups here uh, would relate to some of the data that you saw on the previous slide. For every single one of these, we have a more friendly display name that would be available to the end user. So when someone searches for the person Mary, they would actually get a number of other data-driven groups pertaining to their role, their team, or their direct reports so that instead of creating an ad hoc group that's tied to just a person, it's immediately obvious and, and available to you so that you can assign some data-driven groups that will automate access. 
And just to show you, this is a, this is a screenshot of our grouper instance. Um, this is an example of some of those groups from where we pulled them into grouper using those names and having the, the current person who holds that position brought into the display name so that it's right there within your search results. So the next steps that we have, we want to continue to manually to replace these manually maintained groups with automated groups. Um, I'd like to develop a, a grouper affinity uh, cohort across our campus to support grouper and, and all these distributed IT needs for this data. I also want to have, loosen the restrictions that we have on viewing the reference data. Right now that's really locked down within grouper and only authorized people can see all of it. I need to work with HR on exposing it. And the next step, uh, since we've consolidated IT across all of the University of Nebraska campuses, is to scale this out and how do we bring these same set of tools to every university and Nebraska State College campuses. The last slide I have here is a slide that I stole from DePriest. Uh, I think it really helps explain um, the life cycle of where, where we're currently at and where we'd like to get to. And the mortar board that I have here is, is my thinking about where we are currently at at the University of Nebraska Lincoln in moving towards uh, a better future state with managing groups. And just a couple of other quick questions, Brett, before we move on to Esther. Um, it was asked before when you had on the screen faculty, staff, affiliate, volunteer, if that was a high level grouping or a low level grouping. I'm assuming that was a high level and you go more fine grained as needed. Yeah, that's a good point. So we, we do have the high level and then we also have the same level of um, faculty, staff, affiliate, et cetera. We have those available in every department as well. So we have, uh, I will, if I needed faculty in the College of Business, we have a group related to that. We have staff in the College of Business. We have all of those high level affiliations exposed in grouper at the lower level, department level as well. And then going back to what you said about the, the, the temp um, status reportings for temp employees, uh, it was asked if, if uh, you have some type of check slash approval process in place um, for administrative checks of, of that. You know, I don't know that we have, we don't have a formal, you know, administrative approval or check process for that. Um, uh, the changes, at least for Keep Services Active and adjuncts, those would follow our standard HR processes, and we also have some reports to monitor for if those are being abused or, or put into a, a date far out into the future. Uh, but I'd be happy to talk with um, anyone else about that or answer any, any questions later. Uh, right now, I want to introduce Esther from Illinois. Uh, she's got a lot of slides to talking about their affiliates and how they're trying to wrangle them. So Esther, why don't I turn it over to you? Thanks, Brett. Um, my name is Esther Cha, and I'm a member of the Identity and Access Management team at the University of Illinois. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about our journey with roles. Um, get the slide to progress. OK. Um, so at Illinois, we began to tackle roles and the problems that we were facing with access management about two years ago. Um, we started to see the after effects of decisions that we made to simplify processes, but instead it got to wider labor, labeling, unclear groupings, and just additions of all kinds of affiliations that didn't previously exist. Uh, we began a set of projects that started with the student population because it was the most contained. And um, we knew our major stakeholders with the students. Um, and so we began with them. Um, and now we're tackling affiliates. But as a campus, we chose to prioritize affiliates over staff and faculty because we just have a disparity in how these user groups are managed. And just the sheer number of ad hoc processes that exist on our campus due to the lack of a streamlined solution. So we're planning on tackling staff and faculty in our last phase. But um, in the meantime, um, we are redefining the NetID lifecycle and the processes that surround the creation and provisioning of identities and the way that we issue credentials and the roles that are tied to them and um, our deprovisioning processes as well. So if you're not faculty, staff, or student, who are you? Um, on our campus, we've got two major populations that exist in our ERP, which is Banner. And we've got official authoritative data sources for their identity records. 
These are the faculty, staff, and students. But where does everyone else fall? We've, uh, I've grouped them into three major categories. The first being um, established programs. Um, and I'll talk about those a, li a little bit in more detail in the next slide. We've got what we call allied agencies here. And then we've got people who are special. And I'm going to cue the special snowflakes. We've got a lot of people who fall on, into this bucket, which is kind of a generic term. So at the U of I today, uh, we've got several established affiliated programs. And many of them are housed on our campus. They've got a long-standing relationship with us. And members in these programs don't pay fees directly to the central campus, but there are agreements to access specific IT resources, such as email or networking, VPN, and others. Um, the next group is what we term allied agencies. And I've taken this description off of their official web page, but um, allied agencies are organizations that are closely related to the university that support specific aspects of the university's program. And those governmental, professional, and technical organizations or agencies whose activities contribute directly to the university. Um, under this umbrella, we've also got the Foundation and Alumni Associ Association, various startups in our research park and others. So one thing I want to mention about both of these two buckets is that we have a process where um, we've got authorized contacts in these groups who can request net IDs for their users. Um, this is distinct from the next and last bucket that we're going to call special. And this is a literal type that we give to everybody else. It encompasses anyone who doesn't fall into the previous two groups. Um, it consists of visiting scholars of all flavors, uh, vendors, other special programs, research collaborators, and pretty much anyone else. So if you need a net ID and you need to, you need to get sponsored by a staff member at our institution, and then you fall into the special bucket. So um, what's the problem with affiliates? Uh, we don't have a streamlined onboarding process. Um, data on these populations don't come from our ERP, and we've got lots of various processes and people involved. Uh, because of this, provisioning requires manual inter intervention and can take up to a week. And there's also a diverse set of needs um, that are unique to each group. They need access, but it's often a wide range of resources. And it's also difficult to determine who's eligible for what. And they're not defined usually in licensing requirements. Um, and I imagine, Esther, that that special bucket makes that mm -hmm. even more challenging. Yes, it does. Um, it's just an overgeneralized term that we've used to kind of put a Band-Aid on the problems that we've had with defining these groups. And so that's why we're attempting to tackle it. So the first part of the problem is related to provisioning. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, obtaining credentials can be a multi-day process, and it can take up to a week. Um, and the user usually has to go through a sponsor. Uh, who then gets authorization from their department. And then the department um, has to request an official university ID number from our iCard, iCard office. And then once they get one, they contact our help desk. Our help desk initiates a request to my office for a net ID. And then it eventually gets back to the user. So that's our process today. Um, Obviously, as you can see, that requesting the net ID takes a long time, but getting the credentials back to the end user is a whole other issue. Uh, the credentials actually get sent to our help desk, who then sends them back to the sponsor, who then sends it back to the end user in a secure fashion. But as we all know, at that point, it's out of our hands. Um, on top of that, since the process is pretty cumbersome, departments that have savvy um, IT professionals just set up their own credentials to access local resources. And they usually store these in their own ADOU or in a database. Or they have some other ad hoc processes to authorize users for their resources. And um, we've had a question, Esther, mm -hmm. about the ID card. Is that is that a requirement, or is it just the ID number that's a requirement? Uh, the number is a requirement. The card is not, uh, but we do require an ID number before we provision a net ID. 
Um, I've only talked about the NetID at this point, but once they get a need that NetID, NetID, then what? Um, the sponsor needs to know what services that their user can get access to. And in this little snapshot, um, we've got a fairly long list here. But unless you're familiar with our services and elig eligibility rules, it can be pretty overwhelming. We've also had a question about is there a cost or any disincentive or motivation to not give NetIDs to affiliates? It, it is free, correct? It is free, yes. Um, it's free, but uh, we are trying to, because of the disparity between affiliate groups and what um, applications and resources that resources they have access to, it, there's obviously a cost related to licensing, um, and a lot of that isn't captured just by the fact that people request a NetID and they don't realize what other costs are involved. And so just obtaining the NetID is free, but there are obviously downstream costs. Sounds like the long and winding process of obtaining the affiliate NetID is disincentive enough. <laughs> yes. <laughs> As of today, it can be. So um, our second problem is related to access management access management, and um, we're also dealing with a lot of issues on that front. Um, the term affiliates doesn't really exist on our campus yet, and um, we've kind of defined that as an umbrella term with this project. Uh, service owners don't know the full list of affiliations, and they don't know whether or not they're eligible for their service. So anytime a new group got added, we set up some kind of ad hoc policy. Um, we also had little to no documentation on what each of these groups were eligible for and how to request access. Um, and also, authorization is complicated. Uh, it's very rare to find an IT staff member or group on campus that knows about all of these populations. Um, that specialized knowledge exists in my team of six people. Um, and service owners typically need to set up some kind of nesting or chaining to detect the right people, the right individuals and the groups. But they're unaware of all the groups that they need to exclude or include. That ends up leading to overgeneralized whitelists and blacklists and more exception groups, which we don't want to keep on adding. So what do we do to tackle this affiliate problem? Um, the first part of the solution was to investigate. Uh, just like we did with the student populations and just like Nebraska did for their employees, we needed to identify the right stakeholders. Um, this part was so essential to getting buy-in from campus and letting everyone know that we're not trying to waste their time with coming up with another IT improvement that did little or nothing for them. We met with a series of uh, campus units with all kinds of needs. Uh, the majority of internal service owners and administrators, including the library and security. Uh, we're also dialoguing with our existing affiliated programs and allied groups and making sure that our support staff are in the loop so that they can give feedback on any new processes. Uh, we want to make sure that we're engaging with our stakeholders and listening to them. Um, we want to listen to their woos. Um, we've had to limit the scope of this project after we've gathered a lot of the feedback, but meeting with them and identifying their needs has educated us as well as them, and it's established a relationship. Um, unless we made this process easy and beneficial, there was no reason for them to use it. And I would assume that all the stakeholders were very receptive to wanting to improve this process. I would say the majority of them were. We did have some pushback from some groups, but um, after we initiated our talks, everyone has been on board, yes. Um, part two of our solution was to redo. Um, after we met with our stakeholders, we had to come up with a technical solution to streamline the process. Uh, we've begun to redefine our affiliate labels and identifying roles and making those three buckets that I showed earlier more granular. Uh, we also needed to redesign the infrastructure by making decisions um, on where the data would be stored and create a single authoritative data source for our, all of our affiliates rather than having them come from multiple locations and stored in different places. Um, a major security concern that we needed to solve was to remove the middle persons involved in distributing credentials, as you were able to see before. We've got a lot of overhead. Um, so the first part was just redefining the affiliates. And as a first attempt, uh, we're planning on making the major buckets of affiliates more granular. So this first set is a group that is more staff-like in nature. They've got access to more 
resources than the other buckets. We've also got uh, visiting scholars and vendors and some of our established affiliated programs. And then um, the last group are more of vendor type of relationships that we have. And um, we want to stay away from the overgeneralized categories. So the other label, the last box, is not the actual label we plan on using. It's just to indicate that there will be um, more affiliate groups that can be added in the future when, when they are needed. And um, we also wanted to eliminate the middleman, which is a very big security concern. So in the new process, we would have, we're planning on having a web front end that collects information from the end user themselves. The process automates a request to the sponsor, who then pretty much approves or denies the request. And then it gets processed by what we're going to call a unit manager. And the unit manager is someone that's been authorized by the department who can press a button in this web tool, and then it automatically generates a UIN and does identity matching in the background. And it also provisions an ID without having anyone else in the process to intervene. Um, at this point, uh, the system will generate a notification back to the end user to claim their net ID. And this takes care of a lot of our overhead, and our sec security team is completely on board with this. So going back to the first step of that process, Esther, Karen Harrington mm -hmm. asked what information you capture um, for these loosely affiliated users. He said they have to put in their own information. What, what are we asking for? Yes. Um, we are going to be collecting name data, uh, birth, date of birth, as well as um, contact information, such as email. And phone number is still on the fence. We are uh, debating on whether or not to collect that. Uh, we're also collecting the sponsor's information, so the sponsor's net ID, and if they have had a prior affiliation with the university. And has there been any thought put into um, preventing duplicate net IDs, collecting enough information that you can prevent a duplicate, but not so much that the, the affiliate user is overwhelmed by all this personally identified information they need to put in? Um, right. So we. So there are, there's a lot of controversy on what kinds of information to collect. Um, today, we need our university ID generator. Um, that group, the iCard office, pretty much needs the name data and date of birth to make basic decisions about a user. Um, that's why we're collecting those two pieces. Um, we're also, I, and I don't want to open up a can of worms here, but we may or may not collect uh, gender as well. The thing is that we've got so many users, especially from um, other countries, that have the same exact name. Um, if we don't have that date of birth, we'll likely be generating. Um, and there are also people with the same name and same date of birth. We'll be generating a lot of duplicate records for them if we don't collect additional pieces of information. Cool. OK, so um, yes, so we're going to be eliminating a bunch of other groups and offices by with this future state. And the last part is just continuing our support of this process. Uh, we can't forget about support. Uh, we need to continue educating and training our service owners and administrators about new affiliations and roles and what that means for their service. And we also need to simplify things so that they're able to provide support for their customers. And one way we're going to be doing that is by providing Grouper as a central service. And Brett's um, shown a couple snapshots of that. Um, this is going to make access management much easier to maintain. And we eventually plan to use it to provision some enterprise services, but um, not initially. Um, we also have to make sure that documentation is readily available. And um, that's one of the features that we're missing today. Um, and in the event of um, creating all these identities for affiliates, why not use social IDs or Federate? Um, we've tossed these options out. Uh, we've tossed them around quite a bit here, and they're both definitely on our radar. And uh, with social IDs, uh, there are going to be a new slew of problems with identity matching. Um, users will likely have multiple identities that aren't linked. And until we position our infrastructure to just better handle matching, we chose not to implement this at this phase. 
Um, we do plan to incorporate social IDs into our framework in the future. We just don't have the resources yet. Um, in addition, we're always advocating for federation. Um, here. Um, the problem is that not, not all of our affiliates have an affiliation with other institutions, and it's also not always the best use of our time, or a vendor's time and SP administrators to set up a federation with an institution where just a single user needs access. So um, as we know, getting SPs to join in common is also like herding cats. We have to deal with custom integrations all the time. And going back to the identity matching for just a second. Um, Kay, Keith, if I can break in for a minute, I'm a little concerned about time here with the priest. We've got about 17 oh, minutes. So we that's could a good point. We will the save the rest of the questions for the end. Thank you, Dean. I didn't look at the time. So, okay, so, yes, so uh, that's all you had, Esther? Uh, I've got one last slide. Um, okay. So just to summarize again, uh, thank you to Priest for letting us borrow this slide, but our current and future state here at Illinois, um, we've got our ad hoc methods for uh, obtaining credentials. And in the future, we plan to have a one-stop shop where all affiliates go to request credentials. Um, today, we've got many players involved um, in a multi-day process, but in the future, we plan to have a single point of contact um, for each unit on campus and much more automation. And today we pass uh, credentials from one person to another, but in the future we plan to have a self-service application that eliminates the middleman. And um, we've got our work cut out ahead of us, but this will make our affiliate process much more consistent, efficient, and secure. Um, and with that, I'll pass it on to the priest at Michigan and how they're tackling access management there. Great. Thanks, Esther. Uh, so my name is Dupree Dawkins. I am the Assistant Director for Identity and Access Management at Michigan. So in a lot of ways, we are just starting our journey. Um, we have experienced a lot of the pain points that you probably heard uh, uh, Esther and Brett talk about. Um, and also, just to give a little context, our roles management project that we are undertaking is a part of a larger identity and access management effort. Um, it's called our Enterprise Identity and Access Management Program. Um, by far, this is the biggest deliverable from that program, but it does encompass um, uh, uh, a, a quite, quite a large effort and quite a large undertaking uh, for our teams at the moment. So um, to kind of start in, we, um, we went around campus before we started this effort to hear the pain points that existed. So you can kind of see some of these, and I'm sure some of these are familiar to you. So it's not always clear what access you need when you start your job. Um, the roles that people request are very obscure, and, and they are not quite sure what they're asking for. Um, it can also take a very long time, and I'll talk about this in a minute, but it can take a very long time to get proper access. So there's a lot of frustration because people can't do what they need to do the moment they start their, their job here. Also, uh, transfers from one department to another is a huge problem. Um, people wind up with... Uh, too much access or not enough access, and there's no real notification of when someone has transferred. Um, and then need, people say they need the ability to grant access based on time. So maybe you're doing a job from, uh, from February 14th to March 14th, and so you need it to start and you need it to stop on a particular day, and there's no way to do that. Um, and then um, one of the other things that we struggle with is just being able to audit um, and look at the roles that people currently have and do some reconciliation there. So what do we need? So you can see those, the ability to grant and revoke access instead of application roles, business roles. We want to streamline our workflows and remove a lot of the manual steps and, and notifications that take place. Um, we need the ability to grant uh, access based on a specific date range, improvements and auditing and reporting, and then being able to control or access controls at multiple levels of the organization. All right, so this is what the current workflow looks like. So it doesn't look bad, um, but if you were to drill in a little bit deeper, someone has to make a request in our request system, and then the fun starts when someone um, when, you know, has to approve your access. And depending on what you're asking for and the level of access, that could be several people. So once that access is approved, we also then go and see if training is required. And that can take a while for that process to run as well. 
Um, once the training is taken, we verify that you have signed our access and compliance form, which says you agree to use the data as it was intended and not for any other reason. And then finally, your request moves on where there's um, manual provisioning that takes place. So this process um, could take anywhere from three days, a week, two weeks to actually complete. And this is what we are really trying to go after and improve. All right, so here's what we're looking to do. Um, you think about Bill Smith. Bill Smith has an identity in our identity system. If we, we want to then take certain attributes around, about him, so in this case we're talking about HR attributes, and so it could be where he works, a job code, could be any number of attributes. And then we will bundle those up and assign a business role um, to, to uh, Bill Smith. And then the business role is then mapped to a bunch of entitlements. So if you look here, you think in terms of um, what we're calling payment poster. So in order to actually, for Bill to actually do his job, he needs to have uh, access across multiple systems. So it could be business objects for reporting, it could be PeopleSoft, which is our, our ERP, um, and it could be the imaging system. So we look at these entitlements, bundle them all up, and those actually translate into an actual business role. And so the user then will request a business role for Bill and have that automatically provisioned. The, the ideal situation, though, is not to have anyone request anything, but instead, because we know Bill's attributes and the things associated with him, we can automatically provision access on day one when he uh, arrives at work, all of his access has already been granted. So with that in mind, what we decided to do was, instead of doing something in-house, was to look for a vendor solution. Um, so we, we are working on this project with our health system, which is called Michigan Medicine. So what we, uh, we did, we put together a scope for an RFP. We needed uh, an IGA system or identity governance and administration system. Um, that would, we could use across all of our campuses, uh, including our health system, our Ann Arbor campus, Dearborn, and Flint. And then we, what we want to do is to build a framework that will allow us to onboard multiple applications as we go um, to try to automate and create some consistency with how we, we provision access um, in, at the university. So, but the one stipulation that we had was we, don't, we didn't want to replace our current IEM system. What we wanted to do was to have this new system integrate with the existing application. Okay, so we issued an RFP. We got responses back from, from three vendors. Deloitte was the implementer with, uh, the, with SailPoint being the solution. Microfocus, or some of you may know Microfocus is not IQ. Um, which is also our current IAM solution, um, uh, followed by Simeo, which was the implementer, and Savient being the, the solution. So ultimately, we went with MicroFocus, and, and all of the vendors, however, were evaluated on the criteria that you see. So we, we looked at basic supplier information, how stable they were. We had some set of technical standards that we also evaluated them on. And of course, we always have to think about the financials involved as well. And then, of course, there are all the, functional, um, all the functional pieces that we needed to make sure the product could do. So we looked at how they manage roles in general. We, we looked at their workflow, because that's very important for us to do as we get approvals. Um, we looked at how they were handling requests and, and how requests flowed through the, through the system. Audit and reporting, again, and then another important piece was integration. So how do we pull in the entitlements that we need from places like PeopleSoft, or um, other applications and get them into the IG, IGA system. So one other thing we looked at was how did we, or we asked ourselves, how did we want to deploy the solution? So you can see the four scenarios there. We talked about having a single instance that was shared between campus and Michigan Medicine, um, and, and that would be an on-premise uh, so, uh, on premise instance. We looked at then two separate on-premise instances, one managed by Michigan Medicine, the other managed by campus. 
Uh, third scenario, we had um, an instance managed on-premise by Michigan Medicine and um, the campus one being in the cloud, and then we looked at an all-cloud solution. So at the end, we decided that what was best for us was two separate instances, uh, one managed by Michigan Medicine, one managed by campus. And then you can kind of see the reasons there. Um, one of the biggest reasons that we decided to do that is because there are such vast differences in our business processes. The way that we, um, the way that we onboard and offboard people, compliance issues, it just didn't really lend itself to us being in a single environment together, even though we share the same population. Um, it just made more sense to separate them. Our leadership really didn't, they weren't ready to kind of champion um, trying to align those business processes between both sides of the organization. The other thing, surprisingly, is that the vendors were encouraging us to, to not move into the cloud at the moment because our identity management systems are on-premise and they were concerned about some latency between, uh, between those systems if we had our IGA system uh, sitting in the cloud. And then uh, Michigan Medicine, of course, has some, because their health uh, healthcare had some high availability requirements and they thought they could address those better if, um, if they were on-premise. All right, so we have um, selected some pilot participants. As I said, we are just starting this process. In fact, our vendor, uh, MicroFocus, uh, showed up on campus last week, so this is their second week. We have our IGA system systems installed on both, on both campuses, and we are working to load data in them actually as we speak. Uh, in fact, there's a training class that's taking place right now where people are going through the environment, going through the system, and looking uh, to see what it can do. But we have three pilots here. Um, our uh, College of Engineering um, has a door access uh, requirement where they give access after hours. That is all based on role. Our PeopleSoft procurement has, um, has gives access to that module, again, based on some well-defined roles. And then our University of Michigan Dearborn campus uses Active Directory to grant access to systems. So we think we can take what they are currently doing uh, whether they are these homegrown databases and manual processes, and we, we um, believe that we can automate them. And one of the reasons we chose these was, was because their roles were already very clearly defined. And so it, was, it was, will be a matter of just grabbing those roles, loading them into the system, and then attaching them to, to um, their entitlement. We know eventually we're going to have to do some sort of role mining because these, these applications aren't going to be as clearly defined as the ones that you see here. And so we are, we'll be working with our vendor and we'll be working with um, consultants to help us figure out uh, the best method to do that role mining. Um, and then our key deliverables from our pilots. Um, again, kind of the first one is really important. We want to establish a governance structure that supports how we manage roles um, and how we make decisions about roles, and that governance structure is going to stretch across both campus and Michigan Medicine. Of course, we also want to make sure that our reporting and, and analytics capabilities work in this system, um, and that we are able to do the level of audits that we that that we need to do. We also want to make sure that we can identify risks associated with roles, so looking for orphan accounts or inappropriate access. Um, and um, also looking for more opportunities to automate, um, automate, do more automated provisioning, or maybe better said, uh, day zero provisioning. Again, when you show up at work on your first day, maybe a vast majority of your of your uh, access has already been defined. And related to that, how many systems are you onboarding uh, into uh, integrate with this? And and I think the question also asked what the time frame was for phase one, please. So, um, later. Yeah, so we um, are planning to start with essentially three applications at the moment, um, and uh, specifically with PeopleSoft, only the procurement module. Eventually, we will look for the heavy hitter applications and move those in uh, into the system. Our time frame is um, we hope to complete our pilot uh, within this calendar year. We originally scheduled to complete the pilot in June. We had our contract negotiations actually ran on a little longer than we expected, 
So we are going to push our pilots out until uh, December of this year. Okay, and then just summarizing um, our current state, future state. So the um, mortarboard you can look, it, it represents campus, the stethoscope represents Michigan Medicine and where, where, they, where we all are on the maturity scale. Uh, so today we are doing a lot of requesting of access based on application roles. Of course, we want to move to uh, where we are requesting based on business roles instead and then there'll be much more consistency with the way that roles are, are managed. Um, we do a lot of manual access provisioning today. We want to move to be more efficient and do more automated access, uh, access provisioning uh, instead. And then um, you can see both campus and Michigan Medicine are really terrible with, uh, with record keeping and, and being able to track what, what our users have access to. Um, and again, the big, one of the big things that we're concerned with is when jobs change and not being uh, notified of that. So of course we want to move so we have um, more robust uh, audit capabilities and then more automatic notification when jobs have changed, which will make us much more secure. All right, uh, Dean, I, or um, Keith, I can turn it back over to you. All right, and we are just about out of time, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up here. Uh, thank you for all of the great information from our three presenters today. Um, you guys have some some interesting things going on, and you are really leading the way with this. We appreciate you sharing. Thank you to uh, for everyone who attended and all the good questions. Um, please uh, take a look at the chat window. Dean has added the survey. Uh, we'd like to uh, know what you thought. It helped to guide the future direction of IAM Online and uh, perhaps suggest some future topics you'd like to hear about. Uh, and also check out the chat window for two uh, very important upcoming IAM Online dealing with the incoming baseline expectations. Uh, but that is all we have time for this week. So thank you, everyone, and have a great afternoon. Great. Thank you, Keith, and thanks, everybody, for attending today.